Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where Alex and I aim to answer as many of your bike, tech and maintenance related questions within the allotted time. As ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Right, first yeah. question is from Kieran Williams dash CH three FW. Unfortunately, I got a puncture on both road tires and gravel tires. Both were set up tubeless and the holes are not sealing even with tubeless plugs. There's over 100 pounds worth of tires with good life left in them that I would prefer not to waste. Is it possible to patch a tire internally and then reset them up tubeless? Would this put the tire out of balance and possibly damage the wheel, especially on the low, lighter road bike tire? Yes, you can patch tubeless tires up. I've done it in the past. It won't put, well, I mean, technically it's gonna put the wheel out of balance, but we're talking such a small difference here and the fact it wasn't perfectly balanced in the first place. Yeah. Um, what I would say I'd be mindful of is the size of the cut or hole that you're trying to patch up might be that a normal inner tube patch on the inside of the tire might not be strong enough to support it. Mm. Um, but you can always patch it and run it tubeless or you could patch it and run it with an inner tube in. I've uh, currently got a hole in one of my tires yeah. on my Pinarello at the moment. The rear tire got a puncture. I plugged it with a diner plug. Yeah. And since then I've put in about 600 kilometers on it, no problems. So you just left it with a diner plug in? Yeah. Yeah, fair. Well, that's what you do on a car tire. Yeah, yeah. And they, and they work, and they stay in. That's I'm fine. just of the mindset of it would, it would really grind my gears inside knowing that the diner plug is in there and I would want to then take it out and try and patch it up. But that's just because I'm a bit weird like that. <laughs> yeah, well, right. it works. So. Yeah. Well. Next question, over to you. You uh, Lamerts says the answer is probably quite simple but still my brother has a bike with disc brakes and quick release skewers most fancy pants wheel sets with disc brakes are with through axle hubs are there special quick release wheels on the market with disc brakes or can you convert through axle wheels to quick release wheels with different end caps love you bike um so yeah back in around 2014 2015 when um, disc brakes were starting to emerge. It wasn't apparent if they were going to be with through axles, and if so, what size diameter through <laughs> axle that was going to be, <clears throat> or with quick release. And so, quite a few bikes, notably Cannondale with their Super Six disc, which came out at the time, um, were done with uh, through axles. And at the time, Mavic were doing wheels with conversion kits that were for both 12mm mm. through axle um, and quick release so yeah this, it does exist and I think it's still an option on lots of different wheel sets today is that you can choose um, the end caps that are in the hubs but also <clears throat> like this question alludes to you can convert them there is there's um, adapters out there which will go and convert through axle wheel to have the quick release end caps in mm. I've actually used these products in the past the ones I bought were from Amazon they were like 20 pounds little machined aluminium mm. things um, and that should kind of offer you a solution to your problem. Yeah. There you go. Next question is from... Blah, blah. <laughs> blah, 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 5604. They say, I recently bought a dual-sided power meter and can see from the data that I have a bias towards my left leg being more powerful. 53, 47% split. Is this a problem? And how do I fix it? Depends on the power meter. <laughs> go on. Well, uh, some power meters seem to just notoriously always give a different measurement for each side and yeah. it's not actually so I'm gonna say yeah that's a really valid point it depends on the accuracy of your power meter and what setup you're using and I think this is a common misconception once people get this information everyone naturally assumes you've got to have 50 50 split of course that's like the goal to achieve but in reality that's pretty much never ever going to happen there's always going to be a little bit of a bias just from like what foot you lead with, whether you're right-handed, left-handed, how your position is on the bike. And I I was always told as a rule of thumb, unless the difference is greater than 5%, you shouldn't be trying to worry about trying to make significant changes to address it. But that's just what I was told. So there you go. Don't, don't stress, basically. Yeah, I, I <laughs> wouldn't. I don't pay attention to it. No. I don't worry about it. Doesn't. It's not a metric that I focus on at all. Yeah. There you go. Uh, through Sam's Cam says, Hi guys, big fan of GCN. Thanks for picking up my techie question. I ride a bike with Shimano Sora. Recently, I've changed the chain, cassette, and small front ring. 
Now it's the big <clears throat> ring waiting for its turn. I just wanted to know if I can fit a 50 tooth Shimano Claris chain ring instead of Sora, as the price difference between the two is significant. Thanks much and thanks for your help. Well, the, the answer is there's a lot of chain rings that you could fit. <laughs> yeah. Um, the key thing is getting the bolt spacing diameter right. So it should be 110 bolt spacing diameter or BCD as it's written. Um, and I'd imagine if it's the latest edition of Sora and Claris, then they both share the same four bolt uh, crank set. So as long as you have uh, a chain ring that is designed <coughs> for that Shimano four bolt spacing and is 110 BCD, it should work. Um, and it doesn't have to be a Shimano one. You can get ones from FSA and other aftermarket uh, like brands as well. Yeah, the only thing that I would say is whilst it might fit mixing a different um, sort of series of chain set to a crank, it might be that the transition from the chain ring to where the crank arm meets might not be quite as smooth if you're using a slightly different one. Yes, yeah, so it might not look as good, yeah. but functionally it should yeah. still work. <clears throat> there you go. Um, Parker65 says... Cautious if Ollie and Reginald, <laughs> that's me, have ever had any non-essential slash non-drivetrain accessories fail on a ride. Last fall, my front light failed on an early morning ride. It was not a battery issue as I charged it just before leaving and charged it again upon return. The light just failed. Is it me wondering, but is there a recommended replacement for accessories like lights and stuff to avoid a situation in the future? Well, no, there isn't a specific time frame for all sorts of different components, especially if they're like non-wearing components. Yeah. Yeah, I think you've got to go off of um, other riders and other people's experiences. So do you have any examples of Yeah, of lo similar? loads of things. I mean, firstly, we've, you know, oh God, we've all been on, on that club run <laughs> with yeah. the old timer that's still wearing the same set of bib shorts he's been wearing since 1987. You've seen a little bit more than you want to. And they've gone see-through. <clears throat> yeah. I think, yeah, yeah big are those, but uh, yeah. Um, I mean, on bikes, one that stands out is saddles. Saddles yeah. do take all your weight, and over time they do start to just deform and sag, and they don't quite support you in the way that they should. They last a very, very, very long time, but uh, yeah, yeah, like saddles is one. Another one um, would be like brake calipers. Like you'll change your braking surfaces, you'll change yeah. your brake cables, <laughs> but... Event and it's usually the rear one that goes first because of so much extra dirt just crap yeah blasted crud into blasting it. into it from yeah. the rear wheel, but eventually sort of the bushings and the springs in in like a brake caliper go so that they don't spring back and respond in the same. Unfortunately, way. sometimes things do just break, and there isn't always a reason for that. Like this person saying about how they've had a, a light fail. I had a rear light break uh, last winter, and I was kind of the same principle as oh maybe the battery's broken or he's charging <laughs> turns out over time one of the little wires had rattled off of the circuit board so he soldered it back on it was good to go again mm. um so yeah i think it's just a case of using common sense and the saddle is definitely an area where i would say people wouldn't ever assume to replace that because it still looks to be okay but it definitely will sag over time um right next well, question I'll tell, you, I'll tell you another one. <clears throat> oh, go on please that you start that we're starting to see more now um for those people who run electronic group sets yeah. for batteries. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So, like, if you've got an electronic group set that's, you know, five, six years old and you and you ride quite a lot, the constant charging cycles of, say, like a DI2 battery, yeah. like the battery on your phone or your laptop or whatever, they eventually go. It's easy. You just have to replace the battery and it's fine again. But yeah. that is something we are starting to see as well. <clears throat> Okay, I'd not actually thought about it like that. Um, next question is from Jim Burgess42069. You go with this one. Uh, how wide of a wheel is too wide? I'm considering 650B uh, slash 27 five inch wheels for my gravel bike, and they fit a maximum of 47 millimeter tires per the manufacturer. I see most gravel tires come in at 25 millimeter internal width. Um, yet, as a build, I could go much wider. Do I gain any benefits with ultra-wide wheel matched to the tire width? Uh, the tires already have uh, heavy. The tires are already heavy, yeah. so weight isn't much of a consideration. <clears throat> so, okay, this is something I think the way the wheel and tire industry is going, generally everything's getting wider, and I think it's leading to a lot of confusion for some people. But the rule of thumb is, 
if you're using a wider tyre, you should generally match that up with a wider internal rim width to help support the tyre. Mm. It's no good having a skinny little wheel rim than having this giant balloon of a tyre because it's not going to work correctly. But also, if you're using an incredibly wide wheel rim, you don't want to use too skinny a tyre because it's not going to be secure and held, held in place. 25 mil is what I would say pretty acceptable to run a 47 millimeter tire on, but there is the ETRT, ETRTO guidelines to make sure that you've got a tire that has been physically tested and deemed to be safe to work the internal rim with. Yeah. So always stick to that. But then recently brands like um, Zip have kind of tried to break the mold with like the widest internal rim with gravel I think the world's ever seen. Like, so, where where do you go with that? Some people are still small, 25. They're going with like 30-odd millimetre internal rim width. Big tyres. Yeah. Big tyres require a wider internal rim width, and you've got to deem it on the individual's components that you're using. Basically. If you're riding on rough terrain, yeah. big tyres, great. Mm-hmm. Wider is better. Yeah, go for that. Um, DJM Sydney next with, I'm currently running 28 millimeter tubeless tires, but when inflated, they measure 30 millimeters via calipers. What is the correct measure to use to determine the inflation pressure? Um, the uninflated measurement, 28 millimeters, or the inflated measure, 30 millimeters, the inflated measure. Yeah. What they pump out to is how you use that. That's when the you most use important like the thing. Silica mm-hmm. tire pressure calculator or something, use that. So that, yeah, that's, that's actually a brilliant example is it specifically says on there, the physical tyres measured width. The, do be careful though, because um, there are other calculators out there where you can just put in the value that's written on the side of the tyre. Mm. And unless you're telling the calculator the internal rim width as well, it might not always be as accurate as it could mm. be. There you go. Um, on to our last question for this week's tech link. It's from Matthew Maborang. They say... Hello, Alex and Dr. O, brackets, Dr. Oliver, a.k.a. the green, white, red, black Power Ranger. Okay. That's you. Apparently. (laughs) The bike I'm using is the Arano Gravel Fat Bike, 26-inch diameter, 4-inch wide tyres with SRAM Apex 2x10 microshift. We've got a load of information about the bike here. Mm. Let's skim through to get to the question. So, the third highest sprocket on my rear cassette was bent. It's a Sunrace 10-speed. 11 to 42. Is there a way to straighten the sprocket as well as optimizing the shifting because the rear derailleur can only handle up to a 36 and the maximum sprocket that they're using is a 42? Um, They're looking forward to getting the bikes out for a longest bike packing trip they've done so far, 700 kilometers. Um, Right, let's take this back to the main bit of the question. They've bent the sprocket on the cassette. I don't think there's a sensible way of straightening it. Yes, you could take the cassette apart and straighten out one of the sprockets. But if you're going on a 700 kilometer bike packing trip, you yeah, want to know for, you want to know for certain yeah. that your cassette's going to be If that fine. were me, if that were me, I would get a new cassette. Yeah. I feel like if you you know, you're doing an amazing ride adventure of a lifetime here, don't compromise it by taking something out that can potentially fail. Yeah. And you might structurally weaken something by bending it back. So I'd probably do that. Keep your old cassette. Try and fix it. You can always use it when you're back home and you're doing shorter rides and you yeah. might be able to fix it. But for the sake of that, I think. And then in terms of the capacity of the rear cassette compared to the cassette, the capacity of the rear derailleur, sorry, compared to the cassette you're using, 36 tooth derailleur is probably not really going to enjoy working with a 42 tooth cassette. It's quite a big jump between those, right? I would look to, if that was me, to optimise that system to work correctly, Try to stick within the capacity of the derailleur. You can always go a little bit more. I think there's scope for that. Mm. And then maybe if you still want to keep the overall gear ratios and ranges that you have, you might be best off using a smaller chain ring. And then you can keep your rear derailleur happy, but smaller chain ring is going to give you those same overall gear ratios. Um, right. I hope that's clear that up. And well, I wish you the best of luck for your bike packing trip, actually. Yeah, um, that'd be mega. Hope that cassette holds up if you try and strain it out. Send us a picture of the bike for the bike vault. <laughs> yeah. Right, that's it for this week's GCN Tech Clinic. Hope we've answered your questions. I say it every week. Sorry if we haven't got to them, but be persistent. Put them in the comment section down below, and we'll get to them next week. Mm. Bye.